off and I'm, I'm guessing we don't have too much of a crappy sound in here because uh, uh, they're, they're a little bit busy in today's topic, right? Yeah. And this Private Peaceful is one of those things where I'm only becoming aware of it now, even though 2003, the novel, it's, it's been, you know, stage production 2004, it was a movie in 2013 with Adam Connor. When, when did you um, first come, become aware of this? Uh, Ashamed to say, the audition. Uh, hey. When I got the audition notice, yeah, I uh, I looked up what it was. Um, I, I I just hadn't read it. I knew Murpurgo from uh, War Horse, obviously, that's the one that I think everyone knows him from. But uh, yeah, just when researching for the audition, I picked up the book and read it, and that was my first experience of it. So it, it has, I guess, like War Horse, it has that sort of. Uh, Deep emotional effect on people. People tend to sort of really, you know, respond to the material. And yeah. I'm guessing probably, you know, perfect for the stage. Then Simon Reed. Yeah, a great I job think yeah, like it's he's Simon yeah. Reed is amazing. He's uh, brilliant to work with, and he's so open to because he, obviously he's adapted it for the stage, but he's so open to new ideas. Like he's done it so many times. He's done it like eight times or something. I think I was the ninth person around. But um, he's totally open to it, however I wanted to do it. So I was sticking in Irish characters wherever hey. I could because I'm the first Irish person yeah, yeah. to do it. So I was like, let's get this in. And was that, I don't know that's, well, when you realise that it's got a pedigree and it's got like a, a, like a fan base that are quite dedicated, does that, does that get a little bit jittery that you feel I've got to sort of deliver on something that's already established as a much loved piece of work? And uh, not really. I, it's. I, I care about telling any story, right. so like it doesn't. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't care if um, I don't care if it's famous or not. You know, like I'm I'm currently working on Train Spotting as well, which the fame carries that show. But like it doesn't matter. It's about telling the, the story is what what's important. So I care about it as much as I care about a brand new play. As long as the sto- as long as I'm invested in the story and I want to tell it, that's all that really matters to me. You know. I, I was looking back to your history and I know that you first uh, got into acting, I think it was in prison, was it? In juvenile prison? or In juvenile prison? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, I think that sort of um, classic thing, if you kind of knew very early on, didn't you growing up that, that this was something you wanted to do? Yeah, well I think I knew, I knew without knowing what it was, but I knew I'd, I loved to perform and to like tell stories from a very young age. Um, like my family would see me as a complete attention-seeking <laughs> child, but uh, I think it was when I when I started becoming aware of, you know, in like around like transition year in Ireland, you kind of have to decide what you're going to become for the rest of your life, and it was pretty easy for me because I kind of knew that there was only one there's one thing that I wanted to do and I was going to go for it. So. But I know that, you, that like, uh, like a lot of kids, you had the opportunity to put very different drama classes. Betty Ann Norton, I think, was, it was, was one of them, yeah. Open to see, they, they up until about 13 because then you had to go into town. Oh, there you go. And we just kind of found somewhere else. And we, in the Gaiety School. And, and there seemed to be this sort of natural progression that you were dedicated to. So when you went to DIT for, for film studies and, and you did the... Uh, the crushing move on your parents' part to uh, yes. drop out to, to take acting full time. How, how um, I don't know if that was like a real long journey into the night of deciding I'm, I'm definitely going to do this. And yeah, I I, can't, I I I think I was away for New Year's um, and and I I had. Or I was away just before Christmas, so we were about to go back and do the exams, and I'd done two exams, um, and I was waiting to do the last of them. And on this weekend away, I got talking to a guy, uh, a, a fella that I'd grown up with, and we were just talking about what we were doing. And he was, this, was this four o'clock in the morning, by any chance? Or? Possibly, around, in and around then, yeah. But he was, he was, uh, he was basically just kind of making me realise that I wanted to go to towards the acting full time. So I sent an email to DIT that night saying I won't be back in, and. Uh, and then when my mum was expect my mum was like, Where are your exam results? And I couldn't keep the lie up there to tell her. <laughs> Not in DIT anymore. How did that work? Because most parents, you know, they love the fact that their child would would be in any kind of line of work that they love or, or doing anything that they find that's passionate. But obviously there's also the side of a parent who thinks I'd like you to be on a nine to five kind of area. Yeah, you're not I think gonna worry about you. I think a lot of parents well maybe it's might be switching a little bit now, but I think a lot of parents love you to have like a degree to fall back on but degrees are worthless nowadays realistically like um especially in a creative environment i mean you don't need a degree in anything so um yeah i think 
they were nervous at the start just in case it didn't all work and then I just wasted these two years and I had to go back to college as a mature student which costs more and everything so they were that's they were just they were worried very like you know rational kind of worries but then once they saw that how like how seriously I was taking it you know going in first and trying to be the last to leave every day and working every outside of school I was still working on anything I could to do with acting uh, they, they just got completely behind it and now they're like the most supportive parents like my friends joke because they're just like how are your parents this supportive like literally turn up to anything well, you, you grew up on the main streets of Cologne which is just slightly rougher than Greystones and you, know, you have notorious figures like Joanne McNally and mm. that, uh, that, uh, kind of tax dodger Bono and all that I don't know whether there's a, a, a sense of you know, this, we are blessed that we live in a, in a, in a part of the world that you know, the arts are a big part of people's lives it's yeah. not like you, you can it's not Billy Elliot it's not like you, oh you, you can't go no and, yeah yeah I think being Irish in general it, it's there's there's some affinity with especially with storytelling um, which is like a core concept to a lot of the creative arts you know and I, I've always, I feel so lucky to be Irish and to be in within this industry because the, the acting industry over here particularly the theatre industry is just incredible like yeah. the artists over here are just some of the best in the world and it, it, to be able to have the ability to work alongside them like you know it's 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 incredible it's small enough world to actually know everybody too you know within reason. yeah within this industry within the irish yeah. industry you kind of end up it's it's mad about a year or two out of drama college you realize that you're in the, the audition room with the exact same people every time <laughs> Um, we should say that being a smart man too, you, you know that one of the crucial things in this world is, is to sort of control in some degree the work that you can sort of produce for yourself. So with reality check productions, yeah. you just start with, that's a real kind of, you know, you see a lot of actors do this, it just gives you some control of being able to every now and again make the work that you want to make yeah. as well as being a, an actor for hire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, would have been a, I don't know whether it was just it, it's, it was a necessity or whether you just recognised this should be smart like, and later on I can keep developing this as a, as a my own thing. Yeah, no, it, it started off as a um, a way to, I'd written a play and it was a way to put it on. We needed a production company to put it on. But since then it's just grown into this whole other thing now. Like now we're all about just trying to get younger artists who, you know, may not have the means to get themselves onto stage. Um, we're trying to give everyone that that way in, you know. Um, uh, so we're, yeah, we, we host like new writing nights with the Dolman Theatre up in Cornell's Court every like two months or so. We, we'll host them and new writers, new actors, new directors can come in and test out their work for a full paying audience. And then we try to keep our year fairly, fairly full up. I mean, we, we announced our first half of 2018 program just two or three days ago. And it's got like, you know, we've got two full productions, one of them being Train Spotting with Burden Productions, who are producing Private Peaceful over here. Right. We're doing, we're in a co-production with them, which is in the Olympia. So, you know, it's all, it's all go all the time. You were nominated in the Irish Theatre Awards now for your, you have your kind of double bill of Ender Walsh and Disco Pigs. And yes, and yeah, yeah, very happy with that. It's, well, that, could, that's kind of a great little stamp of approval. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's amazing for them to nominate a company that has zero funding. Like, we have no way of getting, the only Smock Alley Theatre really help us out by uh, you know giving us nice deals to, to help us get in there and help us work it. And they're just phenomenal with how they sell the show and everything. But yeah, for for a company who has literally no funding, um, it's it's pretty. I'm delighted, and they deserve it so much. That cast and the every, the whole team that worked on it are just incredible. Not one complaint out of them. Some hard times you're going through, and they are just so professional and so brilliant. We should just wrap up by um, uh, with, with uh, the case of Private Peaceful. I would, I haven't seen it, so I'm, I'm, but I do get the impression that there may be tears in the audience. That there is a, there's an emotional kick to it. I don't know whether that's something that uh, it would be on, I'm on the right track or whether it's. A, yeah, it's I think so. I mean, I cry sometimes, <laughs> depending on the night. But um, yeah, no, there there have been there have been some. But I think it's it's an odd thing after each show. Sometimes people come up to you and like, oh, you made me cry. And I, I'm like, do, do I say sorry or do I or do I say you're well? Like I don't know what I don't know what they're expecting. But yeah, it, it can be a tearjerker. I mean, it's a it is a there are a lot of moments of comedy, but it, at heart, it's 
Yeah, I think we get mostly invested and often comedy's a great way to mostly yeah. invest in people and then if anything happens then... And, and, and the character it. that Murphurgo's written is just so... He's quite a universal character, but he's just so likable the way he's written. Like it's nothing to do with me, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but Murphurgo is is it, the way he writes, it's just his words, the way he structures his sentences, even is just so beautiful. So I'm well, really looking forward to this. And uh, if, if, if we're um, you know struggling for any kind of uh, on the financial level, I'll try to get in touch with Kleenex to do a sponsorship deal or something. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs>